to Recovery Equity, a series of conversations about promising initiatives and new possibilities to reach and help more people facing addiction. My name is David Sherrill. I am the outgoing interim executive director of FCD Prevention Works, a part of the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. And today we are talking with Samuel Simmons, who is a behavioral consultant and founder of Samuel Simmons Consulting and the Black Men Healing Conference. Welcome, Sam, and thank you for joining us for this important conversation today. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm really excited to get right into it um, with the nitty gritty. Tell us about historical trauma. What is it and what negative health outcomes are associated with it? Okay, well, historical trauma is a collective trauma experienced by a group of folks. Um, so it's a group trauma. And uh, the term was really brought to life by a Dr. Uh, Braveheart, who wanted to really figure out why um, the life of so many Native Americans haven't been able to f fulfill the American dream. Uh, the other thing about uh, historical trauma is that even those who haven't even experienced the trauma, such as the children or descendants of these individuals, they can still exhibit the signs and symptoms of trauma. And, you know, uh, a lot of times what we, we've observed over the history is children of uh, Holocaust survivors, Jewish Holocaust survivors, uh, Japanese internment camp survivors, and uh, descendants of uh, uh, African-American uh, um, slaves are the descendants of theirs. Um, some of the, the, re the health responses or whatever is pretty uh, kind of uh, kind of look like similar to post traumatic stress disorder, so we're talking about um, the depression and anger, relational problems, thoughts of suicide, low self esteem, um, hypervigilance, nightmares, and what we found in terms of the history, in terms of the science, is we're starting to see that this long term generational kind of trauma has um, shown symptoms in terms of what we call stress-related diseases like diabetes. If we think, if we look at uh, diabetes, uh, uh, the two groups that have the highest uh, amount of diabetes on a, a, a higher end is African-Americans and uh, Native Americans. And if we think about those two experiences, Native Americans uh, were here in America and, and practically exterminated and African Americans who uh, have uh, who are descendants of um, enslaved Africans, um, we're talking about really over probably 400 years of trauma, and their whole experience began with trauma. So again, uh, we're talking about low immune systems in terms of their health, um, and we're starting to see some signs of that in terms of that relates to uh, prenatal care. And, and black women dying at a high rate uh, during pregnancy and losing their children at a higher rate. Um, and kind of woven throughout your answer there, I hear kind of a part of the answer to my next question, which is what is racial trauma? Um, how is it related to historical trauma? And kind of the same questions about negative effects. Well, before I you know really get into the, the racial trauma, we probably should bring up the, the what we call post-traumatic slave syndrome that has been coined by Dr. Uh, Joy DeGruy, in which uh, she explains it as um, the results of multiple, you know, uh, results of dealing with t over 200 and probably 400, 240 years of chattel slavery, uh, or I call it American slavery, and then followed by institutional racism and oppression. So basically, uh, think about this. We got 240 years of slavery. Then you tell the people they're free and then you treat them everything, anything but free. And so uh, what happens is you have multiple generations of individuals trying to adapt to this, this ongoing, and I would call it continuous trauma. And some of them are positive that we talk about as re we call resiliency. And the other is more harmful and destructive. Um, and with this disorder, she talks about how do you treat it uh, and deal with it clinically. And uh, the thing that has been missed in this understanding is it requires not just, you know, going to deal with your trauma 
and dealing with what we would call trauma, you know, dealing with it with a uh, addressing the trauma, but it also requi- requires social change in the, vi- in the individual's life and in, and in institutions, which brings us uh, to, you know, this concept around um, what we, what you call, what you had mentioned of racial trauma. And so when we talk about racial trauma, racial trauma is based uh, on a one's race. It's events or experiences that we have that are racial discrimination that includes uh, threats of harm, injury, humiliation, shaming events, and witnessing the harm of somebody of the same race. And it, and it can be either real or perceived as racism. So, so I'll give you an example. Often in the black community, uh, black people will say, you know, when they watch the news, they watch to see if it's a black person involved. Um, it's, it's interesting how we we feel that trauma of that person uh, that we see. We feel that person's uh, uh, anxiety. We we can see our family experiencing that trauma, and that includes the the past trauma when we have the stories of what happened to our grandparents and and uh, down south and and then the the ones who are who are able to talk that past down stories of what actually literally happened to. Uh, uh, enslaved Africans being treated as less than human, basically actually being treated less than uh, or in the same category as, as uh, cattle uh, and to the point of being breeded and that kind of thing. So, so again, with the racial trauma is there's no, there's no way to kind of get around it. And, you know, over the past year, when we talk about the George Floyd situation, uh, we often hear people talk about, you know, that could have been my brother or that could have been me. And there's a, a quote of a gentleman who does a lot of work around racial trauma. And he says, racial oppression is a traumatic form of interpersonal violence, which can lacerate the spirit, scar the soul and puncture the psyche. Uh, Kenneth Hardy. And he does a, uh, talk about it a lot around the country. Now, in terms of um how does it affect the individual or how how might it show up? But, you know, the this racial uh, wound or the what we call race-based trauma wound often can go unnoticed or worn like an invisible weight. You always feel like you're uh, being uh, um, tested, uh, being watched, even at the point that maybe, you know, some people will say, well, you're being paranoid. But how are you going to be paranoid when you got we got evidence uh, of 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 it along the way in your life, um, and so it can impair a person's ability to even speak up or advocate for oneself. The problem, the bigger problem, even on top of that, over and above the 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 sadness and depression, is what we call the wounds of rage, and it's a response uh, over time. It's like when you don't, uh, it's like a person who's uh, continuously bullied, and after a while they can't take it no more. And and people will say, "Oh, he snapped," and 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 it's a you know uh, as we collect all this degradation and devaluing of you as a human being, it could result in this uh, a way uh, wounds of rage. And what's interesting about uh, our our society is we often hear this thing about the angry black man and the angry black woman, uh, when, especially when one speaks up to, for themselves loudly, um, and how we try to back off on that. Uh, one of the things I I make it a point to, I don't back off on it. I am an angry black man. I, I wake up angry. And the difference is I manage that. And, and that's the... The complication is when you don't allow people to to heal, and you and you tell them that what they they're feeling is not correct, then you set them up to not be in their own best interest or work in their own best interest, and so it appears to be anger, uh, and then the explosive disorder, and then it gets to diagnose as that when it's when the anger is legitimate, at least in terms of that person's experience. Uh, you- Remind me of the number of times that people have said I'm soft-spoken. 
and I think about, you know, who I am as a person and, and that's just not true at all. And that, you know, the number of times I've heard that made me kind of wonder, made me kind of think about it, uh, what, how I manage that. Right. And, but the other thing I want to add to this that kind of goes along what we're talking about, some other responses to this is increased aggression. Another, and when I say increased aggression, we're talking about appearing to be tough, to cope with the dangers around one person, a person, to try to control their physical and social environment. So I appear to be tough, but I'm scared to death all the time, which, which you know, the thing is, is, is it becomes a catch-22 because if I always appear to be tough and, and the folks around me uh, are scared of me, then I probably don't get to help or, or folks uh, uh, find ways not to deal with me. Um, the other thing is the uh, increased suspicion. Um, you know, only trusting people within your own network, even if they're not in your own in your best interest, and even if consciously at times you know it, but you find it difficult to uh, disconnect from them, and um, which also gets in the way of folks uh, receiving services. And the other is increased uh, drugs and alcohol. That's exactly uh, for what I was the, about to ask you about. <laughs> I was going to get there. And so the thing is, is it, it, as a way to manage one's pain or resolve their, uh, the deal with unresolved trauma. And so how does that fit in terms of the work we do is uh, I've always, I've always had the suspicion about trauma, especially uh, in my background when I worked with chronic pain is that when we worked with individuals with chronic pain, one of the things we started noticing is, is a lot of childhood trauma. And that was just the general public. And then when I dug into more of my own history and, and looking at the African-American community and thinking about my parents, is uh, my father, you know, if he didn't get his Budweiser once he got home from his job that he worked for eight hours a week, who is 46 years old, he got a 21-year-old white kid who's calling him boy every day, and he has to tolerate that every day because he got four boys he got to take care of, and 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 he have to uh, kind of bring himself down because think about how that continuous anger off of the for those for that uh, eight hours, right? That at eight hours, his way of dealing with that uh, was having that Budweiser, uh, disconnecting in terms of playing the cards, the dominoes, in other words, a way to distract. And, you know, early in my work, I didn't see enough of that kind of uh, uh, trauma being addressed because I remember earlier when I started doing this work around uh, chemical dependency, when a client would bring up the issue of race, I would literally have staff talk about, you're just using it as an excuse. So if you don't leave me no space to even uh, deal with my experience because you don't can't handle that that idea of that experience. You're not doing me a whole long, a lot of favors, at least in the long term. The last one that I think also get over well gets overlooked sometime inside and even outside the community is that the narrow sense of time. And what I mean by that is the individuals have a poor sense of the future and uh, frequently view themselves as dying uh, or dying as an expected outcome. And an example of that is uh, often in the past uh, in the community, there's this understanding that a black man is lucky if he if he can live past 25, especially when we're talking about inner city young people. So we 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 try to have these conversations to warn young people. And what it has had is a, a different result. It, it, as I asked a bunch of young men, I said, if if you only believe that you possibly you are lucky to make it 25, how would that affect your behavior? And and they all responded and says, well, I'm going to try to get as much life in as possible, uh, any means necessary. So that might include uh, uh, criminal behavior. That might include uh, 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 the, the drinking and using drugs. That might include uh, a, a lot of uh, very unhealthy sexual activities. Um, that we would see sometime with young people, but to a whole nother degree. And that also would include somebody not looking forward to a future because they don't see one. And so, you know, even in when I do groups with goal setting, that becomes very difficult for the young men I deal with. Um, uh, Cause the, one of my uh, 
more the, the the group that I really like dealing with is my group with eighteen to thirty five year old African American men, and and a lot of this stuff is um, was basically taught by to to me by listening to them. That's resonating a lot with me as you speak. I am I am revisiting some old behaviors and thinking some very similar things about future oriented planning and and how that didn't happen. Um, I would ask also uh, to expand on um, the pieces of this that maybe go unnoticed or unrecognized within um, treatment settings is how can providers take all of this into account to give, in this case, black patients the best possible chance for long-term healthy recovery? Well, um, I, I would start this answer out with a, a, a quote of, of mine. The see true equity, change does not come without people in power being willing to be uncomfortable, you know, because we often talk about equity. Um, so one of the things I think I would say is really be aware of the obstacles that you're going to, you, you probably will confront or might not understand. And some of them are, are known, like, you know, uh, they, our African-Americans history with institutional racism continues and oppression and our distrust of the medical system and research, which is born in some history that up until lately was, that, you know, folks didn't want to talk about. But also, uh, I think, known to a certain degree is that the community relies a lot on faith, resiliency and resignation. And in some cases, resignation that suffering is part of being black. Think about that. Suffering is part of being black, you know, and these are emotional ways that uh, the African-American community have learned to keep functioning, keep going. You know, it's like, yeah, bad things happen, but, you know, bad things happen to black people. So I don't stop and deal with those things. Right. And so what happens, you end up rejecting uh, therapy and treatment as a source of of strength. And so, so how do I give that thing that I was using to keep me going emotionally that I, you know, uh, 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 suffering is what you do, right? Um, the code of silence, well, the code of silence came out of the protection from uncompassionate system, you know? Um, and so the protectors of the system now, a lot of these, be, the, these ways of dealing with things are a result of trauma. The behaviors we pick up along the way to deal with long-term trauma, unfortunately, over time, unless we evolve, become self-defeating. And, it's in, 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 and so these are things that people should be aware of. Uh, now, they might not be able to always do anything about them, but they need to be aware of them so they don't take people's responses personally. You know, as much as we want to believe that we are all open-minded, and we're still human beings. And, and the more we don't understand people, we'll take things personally and don't even realize it. The other thing is a lot of practitioners are ill-equipped to evaluate racial trauma due to their own personal history and their, dis, their dis, discomfort um, with, 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 with being uncomfortable, which can block their objectivity uh, in terms of dealing with an individual. And one other thing that don't get talked about enough is in the black in parts of black community, Self-care is less important than providing help for others. So sometimes it's hard to get clients to focus on themselves and keep focusing on what's going to happen to their families and that kind of stuff. And that's a that's a tough that's a tough thing to deal with. But once they are able to learn that it's okay to uh, think about yourself in this and in the long run, that's better for everybody involved with you. It's not going to be easy. But it's okay, and so compassion makes change uh, and obstacles uh, more visible and invites people into change process. So, if you cannot find compassion for every client you run into in my book, and that don't make me right, that you work with, then maybe you need to question uh, your work. So, as uh, Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Since we only have a few minutes left, 
Um, we got time for one more question. Uh, what message would you like to share with black men watching and listening in today that are struggling or have a loved one struggling with substance use or mental health conditions? The one way to begin the healing process is acknowledge that something has happened and then something has happened to you. Uh, one of the survival methods in the black community is denying our own trauma. We need, if we really want to deal with healing, we need to acknowledge that you're not crazy. My clients often say, man, Mr. Simmons, um, I don't feel crazy anymore because you just made it clear to you done helped me understand all these emotions I've had and, and um, all these years and the, and the emotions I used to see with my parents. So um, acknowledging that is a good way to start the healing, but also letting uh, people know that seeking help is a show of strength and allows a person to thrive and not just survive. and also understanding that you have value and that doesn't does not mean that you that you don't need anyone else to validate uh who you are you don't need anybody else to do that and and the big one is not to allow your rage to consume you and that rage is real that anger is real but learn to gain control over one's emotions and also um, engage in uh, self-care uh, empowerment strategies. In other words, it's okay to, to slow down. It's okay to take care of yourself. Because I know in terms of our community, sometimes because of our survival as a collective, we, uh, we often are kind of conditioned to put the collective before ourselves. It's okay to do that. It's okay to take, a, take some time out for yourself and find yourself. Because you, if you, when you become back connected with the community, you, the community will benefit from that, and you and your family. And one last thing, trauma is a fact of life, and it does not, however, have to be a life sentence. Peter Levine. Thank you. And on behalf of all of our listeners and viewers, um, really thank you, Sam, for sharing your insights and expertise. Um, and providing hope for everyone listening in. And for everyone out there joining us, please let your friends and colleagues know about these conversations. And come back often to catch new recovery equity episodes. Together we can build a healthier, happier tomorrow.